triplets. I just want to introduce Dr. Bharatpur first. Uh, I don't know how many of you know him. I uh, I just came to know of him through Rajiv Verma. So uh, I read about uh, yeah recently yeah I read about yeah, and I saw your videos. So I, I very impressed at uh, the, the scholarship he has. Uh, he's a former associate, sir, or still? Yeah. Former? No, I, I retired about seven years. Okay, I mean, at the, of English at College of uh, Vocational, Studies. Vocational Studies at University of Delhi. Yeah. Um, and he's, uh, he's trained both in European and international education systems. And uh, he works in uh, classical studies, theater, music, culture, media studies. <laughs> and uh, he also speaks Greek fluently, among other languages, many other languages. Uh, much of his writing is devoted to Greek theater and Indian theater and comparisons. I saw the video in which you compared the Narthi Shastra, it was brilliant. Um, and uh, he's also involved uh, in uh, Indian heritage, which is what uh, we are hoping to discuss today. And uh, uh, he's also compared the educational systems and uh, how they work today versus how it was before. And we're hoping to get some uh, insight into uh, you know, the comparisons after 1947 to now. Um, uh, so, uh, not much else I want to say. Uh, my name is Vasan. I work with Rajiv Verma and uh, Dilip Amin is hosting uh, Bharatpurji for two days. I'm uh, having two events and uh, uh, let, uh, let you guys in, uh, introduce yourselves and then we'll, we'll let uh, talk, Dr. Gupta talk about uh, the subject matter today. Oh, by the way, that is. Uh, it is called the Western Colonial Indologists Classified yeah. Dharma and all that. Yeah, it is. the title is uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, Okay. the unity of praxis, which is action. That is, in action they are uh, together or very close. And by nomenclature they are known as Hinduism on one side and Buddhism on the other. Right. And then we will talk about how this has happened. Yeah, is by the way, so I didn't know what praxis meant before I <laughs> came here, so I looked it up. If any one of you doesn't know, it means practical application of theory apparently. So <laughs> that, that's what it is. Uh, um, anything else you want me to add? Anybody has uh, more than enough? <laughs> no, more than let's, uh, let's start with uh, Madam and then Philip. Uh, Hello, everybody. I'm Yukti. Uh, my name is Dilip Amin. I live in uh, Bollingen. Uh, I'm a cancer research scientist, but I'm also an interfaith marriage consultant. I have a website in Faith Sadi. It's a forum. Everybody, anybody in the marriage love relation with the Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jain, Sikhs. They come to me, I have guided some 1200 youths around the world and uh, recently published a book on interfaith uh, marriages. So that's my major contribution. Uh, uh, hello everyone, my name is Ashish Mansal. I live in Fremont. I uh, happen to know Rajiv Verma through all his volunteering and uh, work. So just came here when he told me that this, this, there is going to be some session uh, on the topic. So, that's it. Hi, uh, my name is Akshar and uh, I work as an engineer in a typical startup here and uh, I help Rajiv Ramaji organize this kind of events and we have been organizing many events for the last few years. Hi, my name is Mona Raval and I teach philosophy at the Futil College in Los Angeles. Dr. Raval. My name is Joy. Uh, I also work in like in some, 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 some software company, but I work in the financial sector in the software. Uh, as far as my thing is, I am very much inquisitive for about the Hindus and itself, how it is all, what it is being looked upon how it is being played upon and the strengths have been reduced to like weaknesses by a very despicable and by very i can say 
uh, missionary movements, which wants to just paint you bad. It has a lot of connotations. So this is the area which I, I look at it all the time. And try, I don't do much except that try to break this myth that's not true. What you're saying is not true. To, to slide is something else. Um, and, and yeah, we, we believe in Ahimsa Parma Dharma, but he's at the Pivaja. So that also comes about with that. Okay, uh, myself, I'm Soham. Uh, I'm probably a bit exception uh, because I'm not out of the uh, US at this point of time. I'm from Bangalore. I've been visiting on uh, business here. So uh, basically, I completed some uh, business meetings in the morning and my brother did. He talked about this event happening and I was so excited to come here. Uh, the sheer interest which drives me to this is uh, more to learn about uh, my religion, my culture, and the history of it, and how things are shaping up for the future. Right? So that's what uh, keeps me very excited about. And, uh, looking forward to learning more about this. Uh, thanks. My name is uh, Shiv Kar. I'm based in the uh, East Coast. Uh, New York, New Jersey. I know Rajiv Bhama for like about 25 years. And he's like a one man out. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I helped him organize similar events in uh, East Coast fashion. We had a Hindu Buddhist, uh, same, exact same thing over there in the temple three, three years back. And one of Hinduism last year. So he keeps visiting uh, from Texas and you know, organizes these events. I just I wanted to come back down and say hi. I was traveling, I was visiting uh, the area. Uh, Thank you, Shri. And uh, I want to say that uh, Mona Raval is a doctor of philosophy, and uh, we hope you can also say a few words at some point today. We have time. Um, Let me see. <laughs> because my PhD is in philosophy of mind and consciousness. So. Yeah, no, the, we are very grateful that you made time for us today, and uh, thank you for all of you guys for coming here. I know, like, they were all telling me that. Nobody comes here unless there is a film star involved. But uh, you know, uh, and he's no less than a film star. He is much better than a film star. I don't think he's even he should even compare him to that in my opinion. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I really appreciate all of you coming. So thank you very much. And uh, it's an open discussion, so feel free to ask questions and chime in and uh, you know uh, find out more about what uh, he has to say. I am Bharat Krishna. I am a software engineer in the Bay Area. So my main interest is I am a Hindu, but uh, and I've been uh, 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 I practicing Buddhist meditation for the past few years, and uh, I've been uh, interested in Buddhism. So uh, I find uh, a lot of similarities between Hinduism and Buddhism. But uh, what I hear from people around is like they put Hinduism against Buddhism, Buddhism against Hinduism. I don't really find the conflict between the two. So I am interested in this talk. As he talks about the unity of Hinduism and Buddhism. Right, so, so you. Hello, um, I am Jake Moore. I am a friend of uh, Bharat Krishna. Um, as he said, like, um, yeah, um, I am a software professional too. I, am, I like Hinduism, but apparently, the Hinduism really lacks the ability to make, the, make everyone involved. So there is a big gap between disciples and the preacher. Uh, unlike um, in case of Buddhism, the disciple goes and talks to the monk often, and uh, he gets the um, information. And I think it is a necessary tool for uh, Hinduism to stop uh, conversions from Hinduism to other, um, you know, other myth or uh, the the um, you know the, the Abrahamic religions. Uh, that's all. And that's why I'm coming here to learn things from Bharat Bhutsi. Thank you. So the floor is yours. Well, let me say first of all that uh, I'm extremely happy to be here with you all. I'm uh, coming to Silicon Valley as it has become famous now in the last 10, 15 years. I came here or rather passed through this place as I was telling Dr. Lee when? 47 years ago, <laughs> in 1970. Uh, 
At that time, there was a, a, an American writer of the rebellious kind, Jack Kerouac. You see, this is the period in America the 60s and 70s when you had what uh, later on came to be known as counterculture. Uh, I saw a lot of counterculture days. I was a student in America, late 60s and early 70s, till I went back in 72. So I passed through this all the way to San Jose. And I saw this beautiful valley. And I'm back here after 47 years addressing a gathering <laughs> on the topic of <coughs> Dharma and Dhamma, Hinduism and Buddhism, the unity of praxis. So now, as a matter of fact, things are much simpler than what they are made out to be. A lot of confusion, a lot of contradiction, a lot of uh, multiplicity of words is caused for reasons which are not real. Real in the sense that they are not reasons of either philosophy, philosophical analysis and investigation, nor are they the reasons of a spiritual pursuit. They are kind of sectarian things. In other words, the unity between so called Buddhism and Hinduism uh, is like two sides of a coin. And Dharma and Dhamma are just two ways of pronouncing a single root, dharma. And in dharma, in, uh, uh, let us say, in prakrita, that is the spoken language, becomes a dhamma. So, uh, like arya becomes ayya, and ayya becomes appa, and tamil. So you see, it's, uh, you say ayya, it's the same kind of I will uh, recite to you two verses, okay, and then of course also explain what it is. The first verse is from an 11th century play called Mahanatak, the great play, no? Mahanatak, and the author of that play his name was Hanuman. So Hanuman was a player and he wrote this play and we have this from the 11th century. Now, in the ancient plays, they would welcome the audience and then they would start with a benediction. They would bless. So this is a benediction. A benediction to a very mixed audience. Because all kinds of people go to watch a Jains and Buddhists, and even today, Christians and other, whosoever is part of that region goes or she goes. So the verse is like this Yam Shaiva Samupasate Shiva Viti Brahmeti Vedanti Baudha Buddha Viti Pramana Patavaha Karate Pinayayaka Arahan Nityata Jaina Shasa Narate Karameti Niman Sata Soyam Go Vidadha to Vanchita Palam Trailokya Nato. So this Trailokya Nato, Lord of the Three Worlds, Hari Vishnu, he may protect. But who is he? He is the one who is called Shiva. Right? Shaivites. Those who call themselves Shaivites or Shaivaha, they call him Shiv and he is the same as Raynokya Nathu or Shaivaha Samupasate Shivaiti Brahma 
He is called Brahma by the Vedantins. He is called Buddha by the Bhaktas. And he is called the Karta or the doer by the very astute and expert philosopher, the Nyayaka Mahishwara. He is called Arhat or Arhan by the Jains. They have 24 feet from Paris. So he is called Arhan. And Arhan Nitya the Jain Shasana Ratu Karameti Mimamsaka. And he is called Yagya or Karma by the followers of Purva Mimamsa or the followers of Vaidya Krishna. Those who are called This Yagya. May bless you all. He may fulfill your desires. Now, what does this mean? In the 11th century, people were very clear that there is one supreme being. It is called Shiva, it is called Brahma, it is called Karma, it is called Yajna, it is called Karta. It's known by so many names, but he is the one and the other. You see, today we are talking of diversity. <laughs> it's very amusing to see the kind of talk we have, especially in the United States, uh, Europe, about diversity. It kind of creates many problems and I'm just coming from delivering a lecture at the remote address to a South Asian conference in Hawaii, where uh, even after invitation, formal invitation by the university about five, four, five months ago, a section of professors said that I should not be allowed to speak, that I should be disinvited because I don't believe in diversity. And what was my sin? That I had said that in India people should not follow laws and make laws about homosexuality exactly as they are making in America. They should make it in Indian context. And then I gave a whole history of how basically the Christian was considered uh, with pious events, whereas the ancient Hindus were entirely of the So diversity, as a matter of fact, today in North America is a kind of a jargon which is more political. It is not diversity which accepts the other. As I started in that uh, conference by defining diversity, you read it. In Sanskrit, we have a saying, Ekatra, Ekatrasya, Ekatrasya tu anyatra darshanam iti samvara. When something which is seen here in one spot, Ekatra, tu anyatra darshanam is seen there also. The same thing is seen from here to there and from there to here. That is constant. In Sanskrit, Sambhad doesn't mean dialogue, it means consonants. And actually, dialogue is consonants. So, when there is no other, when there is no two, Atma, Atma Vadeva Parana Vipatyata, you should see the other like yourself. The Parmachari of Kanchi, he wrote a beautiful verse six lines and Subhalakshmi sang it in Maitri Vajaka Akeda Vijayati. So that's, he says, Atma Vadeva Parana Pashya. If I see the other, who is different from me? Because the world consists of different things. The world, in, in the world, no two things are the same. They are diverse. The, the nature of the whole world is Trigunatma and therefore it is diverse. But that diversity 
fundamental unity. And therefore, I can look upon you as Premakali Atisakali. The road of love is very narrow. Yame do nasamai. We can two people cannot go through this. Only one can go. One can come, one can go, because there is only one. Now, if diversity is looked upon with the crown of unity, then it flowers as diversity. Then it manifests as diversity. Then it is enjoyed as diversity. But if it is diversity for its own sake, for ethnological analysis, for anthropological differences, for creating territories out of one large piece of land on the basis of ethnological differences, making three or four or five nations out of one subcontinent, making a Pakistan and a India and a Siloan and all different by saying, no, no, you are different, you are ethnologically different, you are, so your territory should be different, and then call it South Asia, so that you can manage it with you in the Department of South Asian Study, then I think there's something. All right, having made the background, I come to the subject. Hinduism and Buddhism. Now, as you all know, and I'm not going to talk about it and spend time, uh, these are very recent times. These are essentially white man's terms. I would have caused a furor if I was speaking <laughs> in a university a by man. saying white man. <laughs> but the fact is that yes, it is so. They are white man's anthropology. When the European white man goes out into Africa and he sees the other, into Asia and he sees the other, then he describes and he writes about everything from their color, their speech, their religion, their gods. Then you have study of man called anthropology. <laughs> so it's the white man's other. Anthropology itself is the white man's art. And they call everybody ethnographic. Right? Ethnic. And because I know a bit of Greek, so I call the white man Lefko ethnic. The white tribe. Lefkos. Okay, I'm ethnic. No problem. Please call me ethnic, Indo ethnic, Indic. But you are also white ethnic, so we are all ethnics. I am ethnic to you, you are ethnic to me. What's the difference? So you better accept my anthropology also. Try to understand how I look upon you. I look upon you with some differences. And don't try to make me just as you are, or force your values either under the name of white man's burden, as you were doing in 19th century, or uh, under the uh, process of modernity, or post-modernity, as you are doing now, or post-post-modernity. There are so many jargon. You know, universities produce one set of jargon that we can do that. So, the difference between Hinduism and Buddhism is largely a way of looking upon them as too deliberately. This does not mean that within the Indian subcontinent there was no difference. Because, yes, that is, the Bauthas are a Sampradaya. The Bauthas have a philosophy. The Bauthas have a metaphysics, they have an epistemology, they have a system of looking at the world and a way of defining what the world is. The world in Indian terms is sansa, that means moves, 
that which changes, that which is not constant. Right? So they have an analysis of it. That this is the way the world is and it seems. That there is nothing permanent. It is all impermanent coming out of impermanence. So they have a system, they have a philosophy. And they also have an organization. Some. That is why Buddham Sharananda Chan, Dhammam Sharananda Chan, and Sangham Sharananda. Now, nobody says Sangham Sarananda Chan and then says Dhammam Sarananda Chan and then says Buddham Chan. You see, there is a order. Now, the order of enunciation is also important because the order reflects what is most important and what is most cardinal. Most cardinal with the one who has knowledge, the one who knows. If he is first, then there will be a knowledge of dharma. If there is knowledge of dharma, then you can have a sangha for dharma. So, dharma is for the enlightened, and sangha is for those who are committed to dharma, not anything. If he is good, and what has he attained? Right? And as you know that he has attained Nirvana. That is where there is no wind, where there is no motion, where there is no inconstancy, where everything is absolutely in its own place and there is no food. It is an absolute oneness that is Nirvana, the state of <laughs> All right. But can this Nirvana be achieved in one lifetime? Now there are so many Jatakas, so many traditional stories, and the whole tradition says no in many lifetimes. And if there are many lifetimes, in the whole Buddhist tradition, believes in Punar Janma. If it believes in Punar Janma, then it believes in Karma. Because there can be no logic for Punar Janma unless there is Karma. What creates Punar Janma? See, very often, whether for Hindus or for Bodhis or Jains, it is said that. You know, they believe in many parts. They believe in rebirth. Who has seen a rebirth? Many people in India also, in ancient times, thought nobody has seen rebirth. Punar Agamanam Kutaha. Is there ever any, you know, coming back? So we. So the Javalis, they said, Bhasmi Bhotasya Dehasya Punar Agmanam Kutaha, once the body has been burned, who knows whether anything will come back from it or not. This was an ancient philosophic objection. We have certainly not seen it. Let me see karma. We all see karma karma. And there is no society, human society, which in some way or the other, even the society of agnostics or atheists, which does not believe in karma. And karma, good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust, dhamma or dhamma, dharmic or dharmic. Now, that much is granted even by the utilitarians. Those who don't feel any need for any external agencies. So the fundamental of rebirth 
is actually done. There is no Indian system of which does not in karma and as a matter of fact, uh, even the recent religions like young religions like Christianity and uh, Islam, they believe in karma. Heaven or hell is only a result of karma. They may not believe in punarjan, they may not go to the extent of saying that yes, you can be born again. For them, it is only one opportunity. And that is why their theology makes them so desperate. Right? Either you do this in this one lifetime, or you will have heaven or hell. So there is a philosophical desperation built into the whole thinking of the Abrahamic religions. But in the Indian system, you are given not one, not two, but many and many opportunities. Perhaps that is a little more liberal, quite liberal, as compared to uh, the theology of followers of Judaism and Islam. Now, if you believe in karma, if you believe in punanjan, if you believe in recycle, then the big difference between Bauddhas and the so-called Vaishnavas, Shaivas, Pashupatas, Tantrikas, it all or becomes less important. Now we come to Nirvana again. Nirvana, Nirvana indeed is defined as the ultimate state of knowledge. And it is defined as no movement or where life comes to a or punar janma comes to a cessation. And so is the Vaishnav Mukti. So is the Upanishadic knowledge of Brahma. After all, if you go beyond the immediate words or the catch words, then don't you see that there is very little difference? If what is Mukti? It is Mukti from Punarjan. What is Nirvana? Nirvana is escape or coming to a state from Punarjan or being born again and again, which is suffering, which is Dukkha, right? Opposition of two, Sukha and Dukkha, which is the nature of Sansar. No Buddhist would say that. It is any different from what is described by Shantaracharya or described in Srimad Bhagavad. So the question then arises is, where is the big difference please? All right. There was a big difference. The big difference was that not only Buddha, but Jinnah is a Jaina. And before the Bauddhas and the Jainas, Jainas, the Ajivikas, who are referred to even in the Veda Mantras, were also said, don't offer sacrifice. Do not offer sacrifice and especially do not offer sacrifice of So they said, all right, we don't want to do that. We don't want to worship through this matter. We don't want to call upon the gods called Indra, the gods called Mitra, the gods called Usha, etc. etc. 
we don't want to placate them, we don't want to worship them through yajna. We will attain what is called nirvana, or what even the Vedantis came to call as Brahma, the final state through a method of going within, a method of meditation, a method of entering into your own consciousness, leaving aside what the senses report from outside, but to go within and discover the world inside and then attain. This is exactly what is described in the Open. See, the Vedic text <coughs> have mantras and brahmanas to perform the actions. It is true. But then the philosophy also is the philosophy of Brahmavad, which is very clearly de developed. And Brahmavad is older than Gupta. The whole idea that Brahma is the only reality, Brahma is the supreme reality, Brahma is to be connected with, Brahma is to be realized, Brahma is to be understood and perceived and it is to be done again through a certain method of going inward. All this exists before Buddha. And Buddha became initiated into it. Those who were <coughs> following the Upanishadic path were perhaps doing the yajnas also, and some of them were not doing the yajnas. So Buddha only comes and establishes a whole system in which sacrifices. And this was accepted. All right, don't do that. As late as 11th century, they say Buddha is none other than Vishnu. Now look at Jayade. Nindasi Yajna Vidhe Shuti Jatam. That is, he, he does a Ninda or discard. Nindasi Yajna Vidhe Shuti Jatam. What is described in the Vedas or the Shruti as an act? Sadaya Hridaya Darshita Pashu Ghatam. Because he was a man of great sympathy and sensitivity, so he said, Don't do animal sacrifice. This is wrong. Nindas Yajna Videshu Ghatam. Sadaya Hridaya Darshita Pashukhatam Keshava Dhrita Buddha Jaira Jaya Jaya So this is Sagadita, Order of Nanath, Nath of Jagat, the Lord of the world, all the three worlds. He is Krishna. He came down as Did Buddha also not have avatar? He was born so many times as Bodhisattva before he became Buddha. Am I wrong, Michael? Is there any dispute? Anybody? So, the Buddhist tradition accepts Punarjan, it accepts Karma, it accepts that there can be a slightly different path of going within, which is already Shruti Jatam. One Shruti Jatam is Yajna, the other is the path of undergoing within, Brahma Jnana, Brahma Jigyasa, exploring the ultimate reality and doing it through a practice. So, where is that place? Great difference is only in choosing certain methodologies. Buddha made the sun. 
the sung flower and the sung accepted largely the same principles of art largely the same principles of aesthetics and largely the same principles of icon it is said that both the the first ones to make icon it's a common cliche i don't think it is true but anyway even if i say yes because the concept of an icon is present in the vedas also you see it's very limited type of thinking and very often arya samaj is a very uh, strong in saying there is that there is no icon in the vedas brahma has no icon tasya pratima nasti there is no pratima no idol there is no icon right no painting no sculpted body vigraha or any vedic deities all right granted but it is a vak murti every devata is described as a dev as a person in anthropomorphic form indra is different varun is different mitra is different colors of their clothes their habit they are all different but they have a form they are not form i have a question yes the problem is this as when i started reading this um i thought that rishis who manifested everything in veda right from the rig veda to the last one they are trying to explain the biggest problem which we are saying how this this thing where the organization began and how we can go from like what we call it now black holes all these things coming together and going in those things are things are okay, wrong okay i take that up at the end of the yeah. talk i think you know because that's very important but i come to that you know because i wanted to add one thing this what you are saying is different Uh, like when you say it's Indra, when you say it's different, it's just a manifestation or the forces to keep that civilization or that that uh, uh, planet or that Earth in a continuous motion or in continuous thing who maintains that. That's the what the concept I, it came from. I I understand what you're saying and this whole method of explaining, but for the moment, let me. describe how it has been through this interpreting it today we come to that so what, what it is a vak murti it is seen as human and devatas are seen in human form terms once you see a devata vaidik devata as a form not non form but is a form then it's very easy to make a painting or to make a sculpture or a picture and to go on to another method of worship you see what you have to see is how all these things exist from the very early source the very that the vedic mantras have a prototype of almost every philosophic cultural and aesthetic concept that grew in next 3 or 5 or 10000 years of indian history the vedic text as it is the vedic text describes it how it is right and how we interpret we can have many ways of looking at it at different times but it is there now with all this thing where is the disunity of buddhism and hinduism now this disunity is an entire concoction i take another important aspect which is considered to be a kind of a 
major difference between so-called Hinduism and so-called Buddhism, that Buddha did not believe in consciousness. Now, this, this is just unbelievable. It's almost ludicrous. Buddha was a Kratya. Buddha prided himself as Shakya Muni. Shaka. And of the tribe of Shaka, Shakya, and he is called Muni of the Shakyas. Now in ancient times the word Muni is used for those who attain the highest level of intellect. Bharat Muni, who gave the Natya Dasana. Dhanavantari, who gave Ayurveda. So here is Shakya Muni, Buddha. And he is Shakya Muni because he is a Kshatriya. His caste is not dropped. His varana, his jati, Shakya is not a varana. It is not Brahma, Kshatriya, Shudra, Vaishya. It is a jati. But it is a jati or a Kshatriya jati. And the last of the Buddhas who is yet to come, Maitreya, Vindriya, Kshatriya. I have not read a single text or any Pithaka Sutra which discards Varana and Akshay of the Sutra classes. I have not. People very often quote, Ambedkar has quoted sometimes, a dialogue between uh, Buddha and one of his disciples, perhaps I forget Ananda, where questions are asked as to who is a Brahman. You have the same question in Dhamma Sutra. You have the same question. Now they describe who is a true Brahman. You know, one who is morally correct, one who has kindness, one who has all the good qualities of a man. If are there, then he is a Brahman. There is no injunction to say that the four Varanas are to be in fact, that template is there in Vajra Suchi Kota also. Huh? That, that template of who is a true Brahmana is it's there found in, many, yeah, it's it's found in, Suchi Kota it's found in Mahabharata, it is found in so many literary writings, it is found in emptiness. Because Brahmin was on the top, Brahmin could dominate, Brahmin gave instructions, he gave education. So it was very important to define who should be the real Brahmin. But that is not a condemnation or a denial of the Varana Akshaya. In fact, in, in Ambatya Sutta, uh, in? Uh, in the, in the Ambatya Sutta, ah. uh, the Buddha even mocks the Brahmins for being lax of in their Varana practices and he says the Kshatriyas are pure. Also, so, please, please circulate this, this, yeah. uh, these quotations for our, uh, including for me, uh, because they are very useful in trying to show. Now, I ask another question. And I, I gave a lecture in 2012 in Houston. Uh, and fortunately that day, the great Tamil scholar, uh, Ramachandra Nagaswani, was present. And I said, now, sir, tell me, was there a separate set of laws for Jainas in India, for Bhaktas in India, for Shaivas in India? Were there different property laws? Was there a different civil code or a criminal code for this? Now you say that Buddha, Buddha preached that you should not follow the caste. First of all, there is no such quotation. Secondly, if Varana was discarded. If Manusmriti was not followed, if Yajnaval Smriti was not followed, if Apastamba Haritika, all these codes of morality were not followed by, then what code did they follow? What is that called? Where is that Dharma Shastra? Is it a separate Dharma Shastra? It's the same Dharma Shastra. They have been 
if they are following the same law for distribution of property, for inheritance, for treatment of uh, women, for uh, how to make cities and where to settle according to certain rules of conduct, then where is the difference? How can you make that clear? The fact is that all this came to be a make belief in the colonial. So, it first said that no, no, the Bauddhas are not Hindu. Now, see, the word Hindu was a geographic term. When you go to the real evidence, then in Persian sources, you will find that the land is described as the land around Indus. And the Persian king, uh, the Rayu's father, he described Circes. Who? Circes. What is translated as Circes? He described this is my the limit of my territory. In the east. Thanks to description. Yeah, see, he, he gives the quotation. And uh, uh, there, there is a description. So it's a geography. When the Greeks come, it is again geographic. They're talking about it. When the Turks come, they are only talking about it in terms of geography. And they don't even make a distinction between the idol worshippers in terms of sampradayas. So for them, every idol was a Buddha or a Buddha. Because they were so they in their minds, the first idols in large quantity that they had seen were the idols of Buddha. So the general generic term for uh, idol or the vigraha in the mind of Muslims was was Buddha or Bauddha. So they called everybody Bauddha. And all these terms were descriptive of the people, collectively of the people living in the Indian subcontinent. It is very late that the word Hindu comes to be known as those who were perhaps different from Jainas and Buddha. But that was only for the sake of philosophical distinctions. Because in India, Marriage was not dependent whether you were a good author or you were a child. Within one family, one person could be both, the other brother could be joined. The wife could come from, let us say, a Shaiva family, and the son may become a Tantri. And even today in North India, it's very common for the Vaishyas and Jains to intermarry, or even the Brahmins and Jains. Yes, because, no, not Brahmins and Jains, because marital alliances were on the basis of Varana and Chasati. So, I mean, my wife is yeah. Jain. For example, right here. Right here, <laughs> she's Jain. But because we belong to the same. Agrawal Vaishya community, and so we that to them. I think important word he uses she is Jain. Yeah. If it was a Muslim or Christian, she was Jain. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, uh, she, she, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she is Jain. And, uh, so, I mean, that because the whole idea in India is that what your roots are what your inheritance is, is not to be suppressed, denied, or to be washed aside and a new identity made. You see, when you have the system that I am what I am because of so many previous lifetimes, then what to talk of a certain philosophical commitment? Well, the this point here, point. like uh, you mentioned about uh, you know, Pakistan and uh, the Jewish uh, Russian uh, portion of it. So, Russia was the first Mo 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 Mo
in the region before the Islam and Christianity started probably branched off of Jerusalem. They, they are following that that path. And uh, the border line, border region from Iran to the subcontinent, Afghanistan and Pakistan, was uh, mostly Hindu and Buddhist at one point of time. So, the, so the, it, was, it was Akash priest versus Bhakt priest. Buddha was a Bhakt priest. So everything bad was Bhakt, Bhakt Masih, Bhakt Chalam. All the words we see that uh, described that everything is bad in that, you know, in the context is all, all Buddhist is everything bad. That is something from the Moorish no, no, point of view. Uh, let me go deeper into it. Okay. Uh, you see, I have to check with some linguists or some Farsi expert to find out if the word bad the word bad, 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 is, bad. bad is uh, based upon Bud. See, that's what you're saying. Right. I have to check first of all if this is true or not because sometimes we may this is, this may be true, but you know, I doubt. But then this is a very recent uh, it's an extremely recent the split that you are talking about is much older. It starts with Zenza Islam. Now if you look upon that phase of Iranian texts and history, what you find in the Zend of Islam, that for them, there was an Ahur Mazda and there was a Algya Manyu. Now Manyu is kind of middle and Mazda is good. And there is a constant battle between them. Now, this kind of a duality is to be seen in those texts, which is not to be seen in the Vedic texts. In the Vedic texts, Rit is one, Sat is one, Ekam Sat. There is not two. E, you know, Ekam Advitiyam Brahma is one. There is no two. And everybody is Brahman. Sarva Midam Karu Brahman. There is no possibility of two. In Zen Avesta and in the tradition that develops from there, you have a good Ahar uh, Mazda and Angama. And there is a constant battle between. So it is from this duality that what you are talking about develops. The concept of the good and the bad as perennial elements of existence or creation or samsara. And then, I mean, uh, this is much older, very, very old. Uh, all both and other things, they come much later. Very, very late. Oh, thousands of years later. Well, first of all, this chronology is always a matter of a great dispute, but I would be satisfied by saying that it is much, much much older. Then the Vesta is, is much older, it's considered to be as older as the Vedas. And of course, some people would say that Vedas are younger, the other is older. And for all those who say that Zen the Vesta is older, I put the question that it is possible that if somebody believes in single divinity, then they from that develop the idea of the two, irreconcilable two. But if they already believe in irreconcilable two, then from that you cannot develop the idea of Ekamsa. So obviously, on very simple philosophical grounds, the Vedic texts are much, much older. Now, there is a lot of scholarship. Many people have written on this. You can read, I think, a very good, authentic author to read is uh, Srikant Kalveri. You can read on this. But uh, that brings us to the fact 
that there is no fundamental system or philosophic thought in the Bauda tradition which is not present in the so-called thing. See, another important fact which I left out so far but which I would like to mention is that of incarnation. That Buddha is taking so many births. He is taking so many bodies. And in the final self, in the final body, he attains incarnation. He, sorry, he attains Nirvana. Yeah. Right? Now, you do not worship Buddha as Nirgun or only as a state of enlightenment. You worship Buddha as a body also. The icon of Buddha, the icon of Mahavi, the icon of Tirthankara. How does this happen? Because of the initial Vedic truth that this creation, this body is as truthful, as real as the Supreme Being. That the creation is as real as the Creator. That the body is taken by the Creator and is yet the creator, it is no less. It is not taken for a specific small purpose to atone. You see, in the Christian's doctrine, Christ, why did he take the body? Not because the body or the creation is as real as the creator. The Father Gave him the father gave birth to the son metaphorically according to Christian system it is again virgin birth so that he could suffer through that body and pay for the sin of disobedience of Adam. So the doctrine of incarnation which was taken by the Christians from the Greeks was with the theological explanation that I am taking the body only because the nature of the body is suffering and I suffer for the sake of man because Adam disobeyed because Adam was cursed, because Adam's progeny is born in sin, because we are all born sinners, therefore out of his love God sends his own son to suffer and atone for us so that if we believe in him we can achieve salvation. Isn't this the Christian doctrine? Right? This is the Christian doctrine. I give you a quotation from Christian texts. This is John Milton, the great poet of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe. Sing heavenly music. Till one greater man restore us and we bring the blessings. So sing of the birth of Christ, nativity, how the Lord came to save us and how he saved us by suffering. So that having faith in his suffering, having faith in his blood and flesh, taking his blood and flesh on in the service, and partaking it, we become close to him. And because once we have faith in him and love in him, 
Therefore, through suffering, we attain salvation. So this is a broad but this is not the this is not the Sorry. Indian doctrine. God does not come here to save you or to pay for your sins. He comes to restore dharma. Yada yada ki dharma se glanir bhavati bharata. Whenever dharma declines, then I come to restore dharma. Abit Abhityana, Abhityana, the dharma se. To raise dharma. In other words, to raise the whole moral order impartially. I come to restore that. I don't come to atone for your suffering because there is no suffering in the flesh. Flesh is not bad. Flesh is not evil because there is no evil. There is no angramanyu. There is only one truth. Suffering is only a misunderstanding and it is a theological difference. Now, why does Buddha take Sharir again and again? Why does Buddha take the body again and again? Why do Tirthankaras do Tapasya again and again? In order to not in order to pay for somebody else's suffering, but in order to attain the truth. Right? Now, can you suffer for somebody else? Can you save somebody else by suffering from him? Should love mean that? In the Indian philosophical systems, no. It is only through karma that the person will be saved. It is only through karma that the person will attain, nir attain nirvana or kaivalya. In the Jain doctrine, it is called kaivalya, kevalya. I cannot attain nirvana for you. I can show you the way to know. I can show you the Srila. Pancha Srila. I can show you the way to Dharma. I can show you the Marg or the Marg. Right? But I cannot do it. But this again is common to all Indian philosophers. In fact, even in yoga, <coughs> Nirmikal Samadhi and Taiganya are very close to Yeah, I mean. Look, that's uh, again a very deep question as to is there any difference? To my mind, there cannot be a difference because when there are people who believe that Buddha and Arhats and Shiva and the end result of Yajna and Vishnu are all the same or are described differently but are the same reality then Kevalya Gyan should be the same as Nirvan and Nirvan should be the same as Mukti. So the unity of praxis, action, which means that you have to do it yourself and only your own knowledge can be something which will be knowledge. Somebody else's knowledge cannot be my knowledge. I can have that lesson. I, his knowledge or her knowledge will be her knowledge. So I have to do my own experience. I have to do Swanu. So what you call Kualya in <coughs> philosophy of mind these days? Yeah, I'm not very familiar <laughs> with this. So your personal experience which nobody can, you can share it with nobody and nobody can experience it for you. That's the concept of qualia which is very hot in philosophy market these days. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> I, I learned something. How do you spell the word? Q-U-A-L-I-A. 
It's used in neuroscience also nowadays. Yeah. You and I discussed that. Now. My PhD is on that qualia. So. Is it selection rule? From which you have the word quality? Yeah. Yeah, the quality of your experience is just your own quality. personal experience. Quali qualia is not a Greek word. So I guess it must be like it. Yeah. It's a new concept in uh, cognitive science and philosophy of mind. And uh, these days it is a big fashion in philosophy to talk about. But it's basically a traditional Indian concept. That, you know, of Swanabhuti. Yeah. Swanabhuti is the only way of Dikkala Dhyanava Chinna Chinmatra Murtaye Swanabhuti Meka Manaya Namaha Shantaya Tejase I bow to this great Teja Shiva, which is Swana Bhuti Mekam, which is only self experience. And self experience is the only way of measuring Ekam Mana. Swana Bhuti Mekam Mana, yeah. This is Shiva. He can only be known by Swana Bhuti, by no other way. And he is beyond Dik, that is space, beyond time, Dik, Kala, Yana, Chinna, beyond time and space. And he is known only by Swanabhu, by experience. And he is Kaliya of the Supreme. <laughs> this is the concept. So, if you look at all the cardinal aspect of both the thought, they are nearly identical with either Shaiv or Pashupa. And the difference is only according to the pursuits as made by the uh, researchers as aspirants. Okay, we can have questions now. Ah, one quick thing, sir. This is uh, Venkat, Kavan Venkat. Yeah, I yeah, know. <laughs> and I have been for years. Now. Good. I just want to introduce him. I, I was sure expecting him to come later. Yeah. In fact, I was not expecting him at all. Oh, okay. I think you live very far away. I live far, but today I got in because I had to drop my daughter oh, in San okay. and come right. across again. And you know, and uh, so I thought by seeing him, he looks like. No, I just want to make sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Very Thanks, Mike. Not at all. Yeah, he's it. Um, he has done a deep study of Christianity. Yes, uh, I was hoping that the mentor and Mona can speak uh, a little bit also if you guys are interested in addressing any of the issues. Hey, this, um, yes. Great. We have till 6 o'clock, I think we have the room. Um, so just a time check. Um, yeah, yeah. After that, we plan more, to more dinner, discussion we have, the uh, better if it anybody is. Anybody wants to join, can join. Yes. Certainly. But so, if there are specific questions to right. you know what I said, then we can take them up. Then we move on to all kinds of right. uh, contributions. No, you want to say anything? I just thought of adding to yeah. the model. Please, please. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you can get to the end. It's okay. No, I think they want to record on that. Uh, you know, he, you can from here. I think he's streaming it on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that this is here. Yeah. 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 So, so Bharati, uh, next we are talking about, uh, you know, there is no real dichotomy between uh, the concept of Nirvana in both uh, and, and uh, you know, Murti Upasana in general. Right? So, uh, no. This is true. This is even observed in Sri Lanka, for example, where you have Theravada Buddhism. But in all the uh, Buddha temples or Vihara, you go there, on all the four corners, you have the same Hindu deities. And they still worship them. So, which is a, which has been a tradition from the very beginning, and they do that. And they don't see any dichotomy. So, much of this dichotomy was introduced in the last 150 200 years of colonial interpretation where they started creating. Uh, you know, this artificial distinction. So I just thought of mentioning that because what yeah, said. you said. Right. You see, what he mentioned about Dwarpalas, 
Now, uh, in my very limited study, I have found that textual evidence, uh, not so much the philosophical text, but cultural texts, of two civilizations show a very, very similar pattern of things about the supernatural. That is the Greek and the Indian. People believed at a very early time in both these civilizations in a hierarchy of spiritual beings. So, in our system, there were Gandharvas, there were Kinnaras, there were Pishachas, there were Bhutas of different kinds. And different spirits adopted certain roles, like they became Dwaraparas, they become, became Kirti Mukhas, they became Vihupas, they became Ganas, and to all kinds of deities, there was a hierarchy of attendance. Just as in human beings, a king would have a hierarchy of attendants, or a rich man would have a hierarchy of attendants, or a guru would have a hierarchy of disciples. Similarly, Buddha would have a hierarchy of spirits around him. And they were taken from one sampradaya to another. The Jain sampradaya took so many kinds of Saraswati, so many kinds of uh, uh, other female deities, so did the Buddhists, Pragya, Paramita, and all these. There was a constant interchange because they all believed that there are stages of power in the world and there are stages of spiritual attainment in the other world or upper world. So the Greeks also believed that they were gods and demigods or lesser gods or humans who became gods. You see, like Heracles became it, but he was not of the same status as Zeus or Athena. But he is a god or a demigod. An interchange between the divine of the top and the humans was a constant phenomenon. The coming from the top, coming down to the earth, begetting children, and these children going back to the divine level of becoming a constellation, of becoming a spirit. So you find this diversity of spiritual status all the time. And this is manifest in India most beautifully in different parts of India. It was created, recreated, imagined. And people took from one region to another, from one text to another. So this whole question that no, this is separate. It has a different founder. It has a different uh, initiator. This was not present in India. And actually, the thing is that if you study even the Christian traditions closely, you find that gospels evolved. It's not as if after the death of Christ, these four wrote their Gospels. Their Gospels were added to. Their Gospels grew. There is no, I am told that in two Gospels, I don't recall now exactly, in two Gospels there is no description of the ascent of Christ. Mark doesn't have it and Matthew doesn't have it. Thank you. Mark and Matthew don't talk. Now, if Mark and Matthew are not talking about Anastasia, standing up again, or resurrection, then they are not Christians. How can you be Christian if you don't believe in resurrection? Because Christ went to heaven in his own body. Because his body was not earthly body. See, it's, it's, it's such a mixture of philosophies. They, they have taken from their own past, they have taken from Greeks, they have taken from various other sources. 
and they have not been able to develop a consistency of doctrine which you have found, which you find in the Indian system because the consistency of Indian doctrines is philosophical. It was never declared as a doctrine unless there was deep analysis, debate, cutting down, rejection. Unless that had happened, you will not put forth the doctrine. The idea of uh, the virgin birth is again not the earliest of the question. And it's there in all the Greek traditions. In fact, Alan Bendis, uh, he writes about that. That's what we call uh, the Holy Lit as Coral Lit. That was the publication. The Holy? Holy uh, Lit as Coral Lit. So he published that book about 15, 16 years ago. He taught at Berkeley. He, I think he died two, three years back. Uh, so, he comes up with a template of 24 or 25 attributes, which are common to all the Greco Roman scholars. So, the most common are they are born of religion and then they are executed uh, in the most cautious manner and then uh, they they are resurrected. It, often, three days after they are killed, they are resurrected. It's a very common template. Then he comes up with a score. Uh, the highest of them uh, goes to, I forgot who, I think this is used. He scores some 22 or 23 or 25, and uh, Jesus scores 90 or 25. It's a very so common he, thing. He's following a pattern. Yeah, he's following a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then, and then uh, just uh, one, one thing, and then you can come in. Uh, I was discussing with my friend Ramdas day before yesterday. You know, uh, the word virgin. It has a different meaning in original Greek. Parthena, that's the word. Parthena. Now, Parthena is somebody uh, who is not a wife, not yet married as a wife. That does not mean she is untouched. This was. This is the social context. The whole idea of immaculate birth it does not fit into the Greek pattern at all. It does not fit into the Indian pattern at all. What about Draupadi? Draupadi, uh, no, so not Draupadi, Kunti. Kunti was a Kanya when she was married. But if she had given birth to Karana, how could she be still Kanya? So you have a different concept of Kanya or Varji. It's based upon uh, not just uh, physical contact. So why is it called Dhamma? I'm, I'm always puzzled. Is it Prakrita? Why is not it is Dhamma? Prakrita for Dhamma? Yeah, like I gave the example that you know there's the word Arya. Huh. Arya becomes Ajja. Ajju, Ajja. In, in uh, Buddhist... Uh, no, no, in Prakrit. In Prakrit. No, nothing to do with uh, philosophic system or Sampradaya. It's just etymology. It's a language, pure linguistic. It becomes Ajja. Then it becomes Aji. Then A is dropped, becomes G. So the present G, when we say G, you know, Modi G, then we are actually saying Arya Modi. In ancient times, in Sanskrit, we say Arya Modi. So, this term, Dhamma Vishalam Yachami, part of it is Sanskrit, part of it is Prakrit, is that what it is? Yeah. In fact, I think, uh, was it in 2012, you spoke about it, I think, Houston, right? About right, this, right. Even, even this uh, dichotomy between Sanskrit and Prakrit is a very artificial one, right? It was imposed. So, yeah. to give one example, like for example, my, I, I'm an idea, right? And Ayer is just a derivative Arya. of Arya, that's it. Arya. And if you go to the, the oldest uh, or uh, one of the oldest you know, epicenters of uh, temple architecture is a place called Ayurveda in uh, Karnataka, northeastern Karnataka. So that that is just, you know, Arya Bali. Okay, that's what, that's what became Ayurveda. Right? It's a, it's a, so even the dichotomy is a very, uh, you know, uh, artificial. If you look at some of the Kalidasa space, which, you know, Prasaji is very aware of, 
the different characters, some of them will be speaking in Sanskrit, uh, and whereas uh, uh, the others, what we call the Kolokya, they will be speaking in uh, the local properties, often in uh, Mahavadi and other right? Right, right. Now, that's what I was puzzled. Why is it a mixture of both languages? Why don't they just say Dharma and Charan? Uh, I, uh, I think the mixture is probably more natural. Let's, let's look at how human beings behave every day. There are some people who are formally educated. They belong to a certain social class. They have had formal education. They are speakers of Sanskrit language. They have been taught different texts which are preserved in the Sanskrit language, right from the Vedic uh, Samhita's collection. Then there is other languages in which you also have poetry, in which you have music, in which you have uh, even philosophic thought, in which texts have been written, in which recordings uh, of great masters have been done. You know, the Buddha said this, or Jinnah said this, and they are recorded in different languages. And all those languages are called Prakrit. So they existed. Now, when one language changes into another, it follows certain rules of transformation. So, Ya becomes Ja. Adya Ra disappears and Adja, Adju. Or in Tamil Nadu, it becomes Aya. Then, then an R is added. It becomes a year, or it no, becomes a I, I, I understand the, the etymological evolution of words into different languages. Exactly. I was only puzzled by this insistence on saying Dharma Vishranam Gachami when you Because and we are so commonly using Dharma, Dharma Samstapana Thaya. No, because. Why so don't they also say Dharma? No, no, no because. I, I puzzled about that. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, you know, the answer to your query is that. There was this whole tradition of discourse in Prakrit, which is Argamagadi and Magadi. This, this is, so they were Magadi speakers. Preaching was done in those languages. Uh, a whole setup was done in that language. Sanskrit was not being used. As in either as a language of spiritual instruction or as a language of religious ritual. So they use practice. So, so Sharanam Gachami is also practical in other words. Yes. I see. And also another example like we'll probably you know. They will not say Gachami, they will say Gachami. I see. And here Gachami remains the same, but when it goes to another practice, then it becomes more different. So, is the Dhamma and Dharma the same? same. Yeah, they are the same. So, to give an example of that, just to build on that, uh, Dhamma and Dharma are just problems. And uh, if you take Sharanam, for example, or even Shiva, mm -hmm. they become Saranam and Shiva. In in time, time, yeah. so, so, and uh, and then to take another example, which is, you know, Prasaji's uh, uh, area of expertise, when you listen to someone like Bhim Sen Joshi Singh, he will be rendering the same uh, right, Sanskrit right. words, yeah. but then he gives a very, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like kind of, uh, MS school actually singing Hanuman Chalisa exactly. is very different from exactly. uh, North Indian. So I, I think yeah. part, yeah, I think I guess that, also, yeah. that stylism is also the local yeah. tradition thing. Yeah. Like, no, the reason I'm asking you is because mean, of this. Uh, Sha would change into Cha. Yes, I, I get that. My point yeah. in asking that question was very, very uh, focused, that this, this is that an attempt at separating Buddhism from Hinduism by using intentionally using a different word for the same meaning, which is dharma, which everybody knows, everybody understands, but we insist on saying it's dharma because we are different. No, I would put it this way that it is a way of uniting people who spoke different dialects by giving them a common denominator, dharma. Then, when they started using the word dharma, they would pronounce it as dhamma. Or in their language, it was made as dhamma. 
So it is basically united. No, I, you know, all I'm saying is if you, if you take an example like Tamil, it is a very enormous grammar and vocabulary and everything is different and it's, it has the power of its own, uh, you know, it has a place on its own. But selectively choosing one word here and, and saying they're different is what reason I ask. I, I, I don't think it's only one word. For example, you know, in Sanskrit, it's Sutra. Right? Right. So, whereas it translates in all the Buddhist states, they use because it's just the proper equivalent of it. Yes. Like, you know, uh, uh, Baratji was mentioning, like, uh, most of it was written in, uh, you know, Maori. Right. right. So these, these Tibetans and all these people, when they are practicing their Buddhist, uh, whatever it is, what language are they saying? See, what happens is that these are various stages of development of a given tradition. A given something. Very early, most of the texts of Pithakas, they are only in what is what was later on called Pali, but actually is Magadhi or the Magadhi. Then Buddhist scholars started disputing and writing many commentaries and texts in Sanskrit itself. And in the whole Buddhist tradition, with great uh, philosophers like Dharmakirti, etc., texts were written then in Sanskrit. See? So then, then this Pahyan and all these more. guys went and took back Sanskrit to China and translated it into Chinese. Is that what really happened? That, that, that so the texts were in Sanskrit? Sanskrit. It was by that time that uh, so many of these texts had been rendered into Sanskrit, then they were in Pali also, they were taken, then when you learn Prakrit, then you take help of Sanskrit also. You see, for instance, mm -hmm. I know Sanskrit, so after a little bit of, uh, you know, um, effort, I am able to read the Prakrit also, because Prakrit is based on Sanskrit derivation. I see. Isn't Prakrit older than Sanskrit? I thought it was the other way around that Sanskrit is a refined form of Prakrit. No. Some, people, some people make that claim, but uh, I'm not the authority to say yes or no. But it doesn't seem to me because the oldest available texts are in Sanskrit, they're not in Prakrit. And the kind of development that you see cannot happen the other way. Right. Linguistically, backwards. you cannot have those transformations into Sanskrit. Like, I don't think uh, uh, Iyer can become Arya. Arya can become Iyer. But it cannot be... But Dharma can become Dharma. Dharma. Dharma cannot become Dharma. Dharma will become Dharma. Yeah. Because there is a lobe of a consonant. You can't insert a consonant. Right. Something is lost. Yeah. And uh, uh, there is so much textual evidence yeah. of uh, Prakrit developing. And then after Prakrit comes uh, um, another stage of languages in India. Does Prakrit so have a script also? also? It depends on depends on the area. So usually it uses the same script, the best Sanskrit. But just to add, you know, Balaji's uh, comment. Uh, if you take the word uh, Brahmana, you know, uh, it's a Sanskrit word. It goes all the way uh, back to the Vedic text. And then uh, when you go into the Prakrit, uh, it becomes common. Okay, even today in Andhra, uh, the word they use for Brahmana is Bhavana. Uh, Bhavana, yeah. And in Tamil, when you go back, uh, it gets derailed as so that's the way. So, so the, you have a very clear, uh, you know, in terms of the time scale, you can see that the oldest Tamil texts are around 2000, 2300 years old. And then uh, the Vedas are at least a couple of thousand years older than that. And then you find the usage of the word uh, Brahma there. And then it gets converted into Prabhupada, it becomes a Bhavana, then it becomes a Bhavana. Yeah. So you see the, yeah, the no, parallel the theoretical, uh, evolution of language has absolutely. So that's why, you know, like uh, Professor was saying, you can adopt a concept.
that must be a pattern here. Right. And you don't see a residence for adding a concept or inserting it. And in fact, it will become difficult to even run and yes. there. You see, no, the reason I ask you, sir, is, is, is just that the, the languages are used to create divisions in, in, the, in the present uh, political and you know religious uh, no. context. That's, yeah. that's the reason I ask. Because no, you were Buddhism right. in India, like you started saying, is being used as a weapon against the Hindus, saying these guys were a completely different idea, a different language, different name. So it, it behooves somebody like you to, I guess, uh, say no, it is not so at all. Yes, it is certainly not that. And regarding language, right. the present day in India, the division is like this. He is a Tamilian. I am a Hindi wala. This is a Bengali. And this is their identity. See, people say, I am this. Now, if you show me a text, uh, more than 150 years from any part of India where a person is saying, I am from India, I am Bengali, I am a Hindi uh, speaker, or I am a Urdu speaker. Identity was not in terms of language at all. People, you, would, you know, they'd say, I, I am so and so, of such and such Gotra, son of such and such living in the territory of such and such king uh, and of this jati and so happens that we speak this but language no, that no, they just don't mention <laughs> in fact that's a very good point because this acceptance, acceptance of diversity uh, is that a very prevalent in India even today right? like for uh, a few years I lived in this so it's very common that we'll speak Tamil inside the house and then when you come out you speak Hindi and it's considered absolutely normal by everyone, right? Nobody insists, uh, now that you are living in Delhi, you have pure language. All right. Or if you see another thing, like the South Indians living in Delhi, it's celebrate Diwali one day before, right? And uh, not with the rest. And once again, nobody raises an idol. It's considered perfectly normal. In fact, it's considered good because you are keeping your traditions, right? So I think this acceptance of diversity is rather than norm, even at the ground level in India. And this kind of uh, over emphasis on linguistic identity mm -hmm. and the divisions is a fairly recent phenomenon, like you know, Professor was mentioning, but also it's a phenomenon we find more in social media and in political discourse. Mm. Right? It's a very small number of people occupying most of the bandwidth and uh, you know, amplifying this. Mm. And it's not something you find on the ground. Like you go to Chennai, for example, you will have uh, an entire part of city where the Marwani is. Okay? And they have been living there for you know, uh, centuries, right? Mm. And then you have the Saurashtrian community living uh, in. Parts of Madurai, yeah, parts of Chinese community. Exactly. Chinese. So, and then, and then, there is no insistence they give up the way they dress or the way they live or the languages they speak. They continue living that way, and then that's the norm in uh, India. You see, the, the concept of Kulabha. But I am doing what my Kulabha, my line, my ancestors were. So, if I come from Tamil Nadu, whether I have settled in Punjab, or I have settled in Kashmir, I'll follow my Kul Dharma. And when somebody will say, okay, I'm doing this, I'm celebrating this particular festival, and I'll say, oh, he's doing his Kul Dharma. It's, it's, it's the right thing to do. So, by having the concept of Kul Dharma, Swadharma, and the concept of Atma Dharma, all these things are sanctioned. They were sanctioned with differences. Because my Kul Dharma is not going to be the same as that of a Marwari. If I am a Naishtik Brahman, if I am studying Vedas, then I will dress differently, I will eat differently, because my job is different. I am doing my Kul Dharma, Marwari will do these things. Now this is how diversity was preserved. And then this also had the uh, the definition of Varana and Jati. Therefore, Varana and Jati, which now is just goes by this uh, very rough word, caste, was in that way not a disadvantage. It was an advantage. Because I learned things in my Jati. And I transmitted them. And I preserved them. 
and they were not all the time contrary to somebody else's. See, I was following my job, my area, my territory. And I could also take a different profession. For instance, I may be born in a merchant class, but if I learn how to wield the sword, then I could become a, uh, become a warrior and in due course of time, I could declare myself as a Kshatriya. How does Shivaji become a Kshatriya? Shivaji came from a uh, land, oh, land tiller. Kumbi, Kumbi, Kumbi. Yes. He belonged to a land tiller. And then his community took to arms. So, so many of them, his whole huge community became uh, fighters. And then when Shivaji became a big King, he said, okay, declare me a Kshatriya. And I think he was, I don't know whether Suryavanshi or Chandravanshi. Gaga Bhatta came from Banaras and declared him a Kshatriya. I have one uh, short question for you. And for this about Christianity. When he was mentioning about this uh, resurrection, about that, so what is the idea? These guys, they say that these people are all lying in their graves waiting for the kingdom to come and then the, on that day they will all wake up and walk around it like they used to. But at the same time they are also suffering in hell or heaven or, or what, how does that So, so I, I actually talked about it in the podcast I released last week. Uh, so uh, and then in fact uh, the podcast that previously not decided, right? That's the title of the podcast. So I think the core of this belief goes back and there's a book called the Book of Daniel. Okay. Rather than Midrash, Midrash means coming, right? Midrash on the Book of Daniel. So this was written around 100 BC. Okay, so, um, uh, so at that time there was a very unique uh, belief among the Jews. Okay, so Jew, Rente Judea or Israel was a Roman colony at the time, and then they were uh, believing that the Messiah uh, or the Savior will come and rescue them. Okay. He will conquer the enemies, meaning the Romans, and he will save the Jews, right? Or the Jewish tribes. So this was common belief, and then that belief also meant that you know uh, he will not only save them, and then this Messiah uh, would be killed and resurrected, and that's where the, the germ of the belief that all the dead people would also get resurrected, okay? and uh, that belief uh, uh, is you know gets birth at that time, and then for the next uh, you know 150 or 170 years, this is a very uh, almost an obsessive obsessively compulsive belief uh, in Israel at that time. So it's not uh, just one messiah, there are people <coughs> who come up with this claim right. and then they claim they are the messiah and uh, in fact there are at least three or four of them who go by the name even Jesus. Okay, so and then they some of them attempt to pot the sea and all these things to perform the miracle, nothing happens, they fall off the cliff. So all these things they happen. So anyway, so that's where the uh, belief comes from. It's more of a, you know, uh, uh, what it, uh, it, it's a psychological reaction, but then in my book I use the word, there are a bunch of functional skills or types. Right. Okay. Where people are prone to this kind of thinking, where you are colonized and then where you are oppressed and then you try to put up a fight. There are at any given point in 411 the regions of the Roman army stationed in Israel. And you try to fight back, they use the word Sikar, right? That's why there's a word called Judas Iscaria. Okay. So which is actually, uh, you know, the Greek. Uh, one so which actually means sikari sikari is the you know the uh, uh, sword or the what they, the one you use the dagger the lance, dagger. Dagger, dagger right they used to carry so the sikari were they also carry dagger they are the short lances to uh, stab others and fight and hence the word uh, from that comes sikari right so uh, so a uh, lot of them when they tried to fight the romans they were put down ruthlessly right and then the uh, romans did not tolerate that they would get crucified you know on the Cross on the highway, hundreds of them will be crucified at the time. <laughs> Joseph has writes about that. So, so it was a pretty bleak situation for them. When you try to fight back, you would pay a heavy price. And if you don't fight back, you you are eating on the meager subsistence. So that time, that's the time when you know all these psychological things happen, and then they talk about you know the Messiah will come and rescue us. All of us will be resurrected and comes uh, uh, later. Like, right? That's right. No, I get that. My question was more like how do they. How do they balance this idea of heaven and hell, saying that if you do bad in this life, you will go to hell? At the same time, he's lying down in that grave, waiting. So who is in hell and who is in that grave? That's what I'm not understanding. In their 
Uh, but how do they explain that to the children or whoever you know, come to them? Okay. So the concept of hell uh, is uh, at least not crystallized in today. So it is kind of, uh, yeah, one can argue it is not there, one can argue it is kind of rudimentary, but it is not crystallized. It's, you know, this clear dichotomy between heaven and hell is not there. There's something called uh, hello menace they have in Judaism. Okay? It's kind of the equivalent of the afterworld, the way we reap the fruits of the uh, yeah, no, concept of hell is very clear in the Greek tradition. Exactly. Don't, exactly. don't forget that uh, Christians have taken a huge lot from the Greek, Greek tradition, although they destroyed the Greek uh, yeah. uh, gods and tradition after they became power. Right, they took their but, ideas. But yeah. Yes, yes. No, but that's what I'm not understanding. Exactly, so that's where I was going. Hell is really clear. Yeah, so, so what happens after? So, so, like what I'm asking, like if somebody were to say, if that guy is waiting for the kingdom come to come up, come up and rise, that means he's still there. But at the same time, he's also suffering in hell somewhere. How, how does that work out? I, I'll tell you. This is all explained. Very, very easy. If you see the Greek concept of it. Now, you see, the Greeks believed that there is what they call the underworld. Right. Illu. Yes. But we also had a concept of Pata, the underworld. Now, the underworld was of uh, three kinds for the Greeks. The ordinary people, they went after crossing the river of forgetfulness. That means they forgot their, most of their life. And they went to what was called a field, called the Asphodel Fields. They lived there in very great starvation. And whenever a sacrifice was performed by their uh, children in the upper world, uh, yeah, when, when the blood from the sacrifice will come down, then they lap up the blood and they get energy again. And so they will continue to live. There was darkness. There was all the time uh, total lack of good sound, wailing, crying. So you see, this is the Greek hell, and this is the Asphodel fields. Then those who were highly knowledgeable, like Aristotle, Socrates, and others, they went to another region of hell, or not hell, but underworld, which was called the Elysium, 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 yeah. So they went to the Elysian fields. There they sat under the tree, they chatted, they talked philosophy, they discussed beautiful questions. It was very fragrant. They had a long life there. Right. Then out of them, some of them became immortal. Some references are there which says that then they came back again to the earth. Because there is nothing so beautiful as the earth. Yeah. No, I, I get that. Concept. So all so this you comes from. You know, the point question he is asking is there yeah. is a very point. One day of the judgment point. day, the people who go to hell oh. and what they have been doing in hell, that is his question. <laughs> oh, I that. You know, that's the point. But so I wanted to ask when how we, before the judgment day, they can decide, only on judgment day, they can decide if they can go to heaven or not, and how. Until then, they can be in hell. That's his question. Yeah, I don't know. I, I want, they, they, let me explain why I asked you that question. Because they, they, they usually explain things in, you know, in some convoluted way. Yeah. And I've never heard anyone explain that one part in any way. Yeah. I was thinking that you probably have thought about this. And <laughs> no, no, I have, I have, let's say it's a very, very, very yeah. common sensical thing to say that, but nobody has. Yeah. You know, they, they, even Muslims, the same concept, right? The yeah. Kayamat and uh, exactly. So, how, how the heck is it? For us, at least, it is poor general means there is a new body and all that. But for them, that body is very important. So, that, so he's exactly. Yeah. So, that body is absolutely important yeah. for them. So, so, the thing is, um, in Hinduism, right, it is not blind. Right? There, there's a lot of consistency in thought, okay? And then you are 
expecting the same from Christianity. That's all. So if you take the book of Revelations, for example, it says only 140,000 Jewish born virgin men would inhabit the heaven. Okay. So, and of course, the Christians read through that, right? And then that immediately should set the alarm bells ringing, right? So that means if you are not Jewish born virgin male, then you are not going to heaven. You should be going to heaven, right? But then Christianity has an escape route. Okay, they have something called predestination. Okay. So, which is a very one of the core theories, right? Every time they come up with, so it's it's like you know one putting one bandit on top of the other. So predestination is, uh, you know, uh, God has already determined what will happen to you. Okay. So in fact, that's why in one of the debates I was having with the Christian uh, apologist, so he used the word, you know, uh, God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnipotent. I said he cannot because. Uh, in fact, I discussed it in the book also because if you have predestined something, then you cannot change it. That means you are not omnipotent. So, uh, so anyway, so th so that's the point. Right? So, so a lot of times, the only reason Christianity has tried this, people have not internally challenged these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, even the Western intellectuals. In right. fact, frankly, I don't think any Western intellectual has really critiqued Christianity, okay? including Bertrand Russell and others. Right? Uh, they have not gone into the depth and critique because nobody even asked a very simple question like, how can God be omnipotent? And while how we can also simultaneously have the concept of predestination. Right? So, uh, so, so, anyway, so the reason is Christians don't ask these questions at all. But again, God is not omnipresent also in Christianity, right? No. It's uh, a separate well, well, if, if you look at Catholicism, right, and the Pope would say God is omnipresent and omnipotent. Okay. So, once, once again, uh, it cannot be, right? So, just logically speaking, it cannot be. Okay. So, I have a question about Bhagavad Gita. So, uh, in, in, in the speech, uh, uh, we, we established that the, uh, the, the Hinduism and this dichotomy uh, is artificial. So, why do you think it was created? Was it because uh, I, have, I read somewhere that the colonialists came, they found Buddhism in China first, uh, and they assumed Buddhism to be a Chinese religion. And any do so to be a Indian religion. Is it because of that? Uh, it's why is there a, a really a, a difference between Hinduism and Buddhism? That to who was created? You see, <coughs> frankly, there can be no reason to make a distinction if you are in the knowledge of what is what. But when you want to make a distinction, then you don't go on facts. Then you go on manufacturing facts. Then you go and say, this is not so, but actually so. So this was a whole well thought out strategy. It's not as if they came and they said, no, no, no. Buddha looks better to me because there is one founder, he is like Christianity. You know, many people give that explanation. That when the Westerners came, they said, here is the founder, so he is founder like Christ, he is like us. This is not the truth. The truth is that they did not want to see the great changes and interchanges. They wanted to establish a diversity which did not exist. So they overlooked a large number of things. And they are still doing it. The latest example is Lingayats in Karnataka. Who in his senses will say that Lingayat is not shy? They did it with the six. It's the same question again. Six believe in Omkar. Ik Omkar. Now if you believe in Omkar, then uh, if you believe in rebirth, if you believe in the Varana, if Gobind Singh has written Ramayana, if he has written uh, Bhagavad, if he has written so many things worshipping uh, the avatars, then why is he not Hindu? But then in 1899, they made somebody write a book, Hum Hindu Nahi Hain. I forget his name. Risal Singh or Rasid Singh. I have that book with me that was written in 1899 because the British were separating the Sikhs from 
the other people in Punjab. You see, in Punjab to this day, everybody goes to Gurdwara. Whether you have cash or you don't have cash, and then you know, marry each other, uh, marry between each other. My daughter-in-law is sick. I never thought she was not in. Not we have never thought for a second that she is not in Hindu. So for us, she is as much Hindu as we are. She is sick. Her father has, you know, he wears a. She is also worshiping Ram and Krishna. So, Sorry, Hindu. So, you know, they are pure Sikhs, but they don't think of us as different and we don't think of them as different. Now, it is the division created in the British times. And if you go now in California, further down to, uh, where is it, that San Diego, where you have the Sikh center and where you have the famous professor, I forget his name, once I had big arguments on him, with him on visa list. Uh, he's a famous professor of Sikhism in America. Uh, he'll not believe. He, he used to give silly arguments uh, such as the word Patsha, which is a Persian word occurs so many times <laughs> and such a Patsha. <laughs> Okay. It's a manufactured thing. You can manufacture it for whatever reason. Just catch what uh, he was mentioning. Yeah. So Vishal Agarwal in one of his, uh, you know, he says, I forgot the name of his name. He talks about how even until 30, 40 years ago, in all the Gurdwaras, they still had the paintings from Harikata, which was very common. Which, and a lot of that got erased in the last three or four decades. Just one guy. No, the Ramayan. The two secret Ramayan was. It was uh, placed at a high pedestal in the Gurdwaras 60 to 70 years ago. We, we know that. It was later on, you see, when this whole business started of separating Sikhism from Hinduism, that uh, the Ramayana was removed. I mean, uh, I think the big, the big division between Buddhism and Hinduism started with this Ambedkar converting to Buddhism and somehow they used that to say that Buddhism was way different from Hinduism. Well, it, it is true. Hinduism went there. But uh, to your point, sir, I think the reason why Ambedkar became a Buddhist is because he wanted to uh, be, not become a Muslim. Not become a Muslim. Be part of the Indian, uh, you know, uh, diaspora still. You know, even though Buddhism, he, he said it was a different religion, it's still uh, uh, part of the Hindu tradition. So, Dharmic tradition. Dharmic tradition, yeah. So, I, so I, there I were, think but there were Hindu kings in the past who destroyed the uh, Kushanti. Well, so there, is a, a, there is a lot of uh, uh, exaggeration about that also. They, they, I, I think, again, those have been used I, by the I, modern I think uh, that there are that politicians. There may be some uh, exceptions once in a while, huh? but and there are examples where some of the places of worship were in a way displaced of the main idols, but this was not the norm. This was not at all the norm. So, and I mean, there are always few, huge many examples of Vaishnava sure, kings or Shaiva kings giving uh, profuse assistance to both Viharas and to both universities. Like the Pala dynasty in 6th century gave big uh, donations to Nalanda. Uh, Nalanda was under Buddhist control. So if you go there and see, you will see a whole layer of construction for about 200 or 150 years under the patronage of Pala kings who were not both. And in Nalanda, you will see some uh, Vaishnav temples also. I yeah, saw it mean, in last the year. Nalanda was as yeah. Yes, they yeah. yeah. destroyed yeah. the whole place. Yeah. 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 But yeah, and that's a different story. But <laughs> the patronage of the so called Hindus, or at that time, Vaishnav, who could be called Vaishnavas, or Bhagavatas, or Shaivas, to the Bodh Vihara was very. Very common. So I did like do a time check. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, so I have one question. Did Buddha saw himself as a rebel against the establishment at that time, or did he see himself as like a completely at harmony at the establishment? Well, you see, when you make a, when you say, don't do this, then up to that degree, you are a rebel. When he said, don't perform sacrifice, this is not the right thing, don't do your thing. Then he is, let us say, discarding or he is telling many people not to go that way. But then when he is saying that follow dharma, follow punar janma, follow the idea of next incarnation, follow the pursuit of nirvana, then he is following a tradition. He, so the bulk of the things he did was following, he, he followed a tradition. Some of the things he rejected, and this has happened not just with Buddha, this has happened in the Indian uh, course of philosophic development. In so many, as a matter of fact, if you establish a new sampradaya, then you are going to denounce some of the things. And Establish something new. I would like to add one more thing to what you are saying. Uh, in a Hinduism, generally, Hinduism is the only religion that offers you so many different paths to navigate your life. You could go Bhakti Marga, Jnana Marga, Yoga Marga, whatever Marga you want, you could achieve the same goal by choosing whichever path you want. And since Buddhism was just an extension of Hinduism, it said that I don't want your one of your marks, but still I'm still teaching the same value of how to navigate your life. Everybody knows life is full of struggles. It's not that Buddhism was the only religion that ever said that life is full of troubles, sufferings, and nirvana means end of suffering. We talking about moksha are talking about the same thing, that our life is full of problems. Go by bhakti, go by jnana, go by whatever you want, but navigate your life and achieve that goal of moksha, right? So people, when they try to bifurcate Buddhism and Hinduism, they forget that Buddhism is just an extension of that particular Tradition. goal. Yeah. Every religion has had the same stages of evolution, be it Hinduism, be it Buddhism. Today, where is Buddhism? If you enter a Buddhist temple, you do this. <laughs> Buddha is not a god. He's a teacher, a philosopher, right? Why do we do this? Because this is what has happened to Hinduism. And this is what is happening to Buddhism. At some point, we all are making it what it is, right? I put it this way. Here again, uh, let us be clear as to how certain things of the Indian cultural tradition have been maligned by Christians. You see, it's largely a problem with Christians looking at the Indian subcontinent. Now, this is something which is found in the Indus Valley. You see, this was a method, namaskar, or just this gesture. This was a way of paying your respect. This is found in the Indus Valley. There is a figure. Yeah. You know, there is a figure showing that. So, people in the Sindhu uh, cultural bed were also doing this. Now, that figurine may be representing somebody in a temple, somebody going to a king, somebody paying respect to a father, whatever. So this is actually nothing to do with uh, a philosophical dispensation. This is a culture. Touching feet. Very few people know that the ancient Greeks used to touch feet. If you tell this to a modern Greek, you say, oh yeah, mm -hmm. but then somebody who, who knows his background, he is, he'll say, yes, yes, Professor Gupta is right, don't think he, he is talking out of his, there, there was the way of touching the knees, rubbing the knees, rubbing the calf, this was the ancient Greek way of paying supplication, respect. Literature is full of it. 
Now you will say, is this Hindu? You see, these are, all these things are culture. And they were followed in India, and they are followed in India by all kinds of philosophical dispensations. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, Christian father will say, no, 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 don't do this, don't touch me, this is non-Christian. I mean, they say, but now they are adopting the opposite role of acculturation. They'll say, do exactly what a Hindu does. Mm -hmm. And we will do it as a Christian and then we just supplant the inner core of belief. Mr. Kulta, one last question. Uh, what do you think in the bigger, bigger picture? Uh, like in China, Buddhism is almost disappearing. So Chinese, they say that India ruled China without fighting out in with just I mean, exporting uh, water bombs. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, where do you see us using the soft power of Buddha? Uh, look, first of all, I really can't uh, say anything with authority because I have not studied China. I need to do it. But from what I have read, quite a few things, it is not disappearing. Uh, Chinese Buddhism, as a matter of fact, is becoming stronger. And there is that movement called Falun Gong or Falun Gong, which is a very great threat. And I don't think that uh, the Buddhist tradition will disappear. You see, uh, so excuse me, what did you say about that Falun Gong movement? Yeah, it's very strong in, in uh, China. And okay. the government thinks it to be a threat. So it's not disappearing. Buddhism is it's based on Buddhist ideas. I, I know I met uh, different people from the moment, uh -huh. and uh, some of them were jailed. And their, hall, uh, their their organs were harvested and they escaped and they came here. I met them in San Francisco and took a video with them. Can you please go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, they, they, there is a lot of protest. That means people are protesting and there is a fight within the country. This is what I have heard and this is what I have read. And uh, you see, Christianity has made a big revival in Russia. Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Christianity, uh, which was a Marxist country, atheist country, which had closed down churches, but there is a big revival. So I don't think that religious faith or spiritual faith can be stamped out, and uh, things will change, radically change in China. We, we, we would love to continue this. We are planning to take them out to dinner. As many of them can join us. It's a nearby Indian restaurant called the Great Indian Cuisine. Uh, also, I have an additional announcement. So, we have another event tomorrow at the same place, same time. So, yeah. what event is that? So, we'll be discussing with Bharatji the issue of uh, reforms in education, education in India reforms. and right to education law specifically. Which and, is and, and the right to education law within the concept of, when you talk about education reforms needed, not had taken place, and how right to education has become a liability instead of uh, becoming an asset. What time? Same. Same I mean, time. Same time. Yes, same place. Uh, can you guys join us? Sure. Oh, Where is the restaurant? It's very close yeah. by. I think Maina half from here. Yeah. What is the name? Great Indian Cuisine. Yeah. Like close. In Santa Clara? Yes, Santa Clara. What time? Uh, we can go after this. Oh. <laughs> we have nothing else to do here. <laughs> Great.